and may the Lord bless you richly. When we were singing there, I an image came into my mind of somebody holding a burning torch in their hand. And then I noticed that they were in a field where the hay had been harvested and what was left on the ground was the stubble. And whoever had the torch put it down on the ground and the stubble all began to burn. And then I felt the Lord was saying, I have not come to burn the world in a physical way. I have come to cast fire on the earth and how I wish it were burning already. And there was a sadness in my heart when I heard those words because so many people are not mindful of God at all and they're not open as far as we can see to the work of the Spirit. So the longing of the Lord's heart is to pour out the Spirit on all flesh, on all men and women across the world. And God will do whatever is necessary to open the hearts of as many people as possible to the power, to the wind of the Spirit. So come Holy Spirit. Now tonight's topic is praise in troubled times. I'm talking about this because it's something that appeals to me and it's something that we're thinking about quite a lot here in Ireland at the moment. And I need hardly tell you that we are living in troubled times right across the earth. We are all enduring a worldwide pandemic and in its wake, it's bringing death and disease. We've been suffering for a year now, and it would appear that it's far from over. Here in Ireland, we have to cope with church scandals to do with child abuse and badly run mother and baby homes. You have to think of what's, what are the big problems there in Canada. At present, our government is intending to make euthanasia legal, which is an appalling prospect. Our economy, and I'm sure it's not much different where you are, our economy is experiencing recession and high unemployment. And we all know that we're facing into a climate crisis that is deepening with disastrous results right across the earth. Now, this situation is evoking a great deal of anxiety and depression in the lives of many people. I get a lot of phone calls every day and emails too and some letters. And people are pouring out their troubles to me. And what comes up most commonly is the amount of anxiety they are experiencing and many of them are stuck in the darkness of depression. And as a Christian, I have found that if we magnify our problems by focusing on them, God will seem to get smaller and smaller. And of course, as a result, anxiety and depression will increase. But if we magnify the Lord, by focusing on God, our problems will seem smaller and smaller. And as a result, our anxiety and depression will decrease. So if the outlook is bad, look upward to the Lord. As it says in Colossians chapter three, verse one, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. So in this session together, I want to begin by referring briefly to two events that have taught me and others about the need to praise God. In 2017, the members of the new Springtime community to which I belong here in Dublin, we were led to have a two-day 
festival entitled God Speaks to Those Who Praise Him. During our time together, and I must say there was joyous praise for the two days, the Lord did speak to us and he told us that we should go with Christians from other churches to a high place overlooking the city of Dublin to proclaim the festal shout of victory over the malign territorial spirits active in the city. So in August 2017, 150 people spent two hours loudly and boisterously proclaiming God's praise on the Hill of Hoth. For those who know Dublin, it overlooks the whole city. And when other people around Ireland heard about what we were doing, they decided to go on to high places overlooking their towns and localities to proclaim God's praises. And their belief was that as they did, God was defeating the, ter the, the territorial spirits, the spirits of darkness that often have control over places. And I travel a lot and go abroad a lot. And when I was in Europe, I would, in different countries, I would talk about the need to go to these high places to proclaim God's victory over the area. And I know that in a number of countries, people acted on what I said. Indeed, I joined in with some festal shouts myself uh, and always there were Protestants present, Protestants present. I remember going to Palermo in, in Sicily and I, I spoke about this. And of course they have a big problem with the mafia. And I asked, was there anyone who would volunteer to lead the festal shout on the mountains overlooking the city of Palermo? And a Protestant volunteered, even though there are very few Protestants in Palermo. And a gathering went up onto the mountains and proclaimed the praises of God. Indeed, I would encourage you there in Canada to do the same. If you're in, Tor in Toronto, find a high place, even if it's a skyscraper, and go up to the top of it and proclaim the praises of God over the city and call down God's blessing on the city. Now, in, toward the end of 2020, that's just a couple of, about two or three months ago, when the coronavirus pandemic was raging all over the world, Mary Byrne, a former chairperson of the National Service Committee of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal in Ireland, issued a prophetic call to form a national army of praise. Briefly put, she asked people to commit themselves to an hour of praise each Saturday between 11 and 12 noon. In fact, yesterday we held a webinar here in Dublin on that subject, which was attended by 280 people from Ireland, Britain, and some European countries. And I've written a little booklet entitled, A National Call to Be an Army of Praise, which suggests ways of spending the hour praising God. For those who are here in Ireland, I just say it's due to be published in about two weeks time. But in this talk, I want to speak briefly about the prayer of thanksgiving and praise. Let me begin by saying that the temple in Jerusalem, I'm talking about the time of our Lord, was the prime location for worship in the Old Testament. It was huge. It was 36 acres in area. I don't know what that is in uh, European terms, but it was 36 acres 
I think it would, was the size of about 19 or 20 football pitches. And it could hold up to 300,000 people. It had a number of gates. And inside, there was firstly the court of the Gentiles, and then the courts for the Jews, for men, Jewish men and Jewish women. And I mention this because the psalmist wrote, enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. We find that in Psalm 104 verses 4 to 5. I think you can see in that picture at the bottom of your screen where the courts are. So if you went through the gate, you'd be in the courts of the Gentiles. And if you went behind the wall through the gate to the second wall, you'd be in the courts of the Jews. No Gentiles were allowed to go in there. Actually, it was written if they went in, it was under pain of death. Now, let's think about the prayer of thanksgiving. Much of what I'm going to say, I'm sure, is familiar to you. The prayer of appreciation begins with thanksgiving. And St. Paul said to the Christians, quote, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 17 to 18. And again, he said, always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20. Now, it's obvious that we should thank God for the graces and blessings we have received. But isn't it surprising that Paul also urges us to give thanks in negative circumstances, for example, of abuse, or injustice, or illness, or loss, or addiction. The list is a very long one. And we, he's saying, do it in the belief that God can bring good from evil by embracing those circumstances by means of merciful providence. If I can just pause and say, brothers and sisters, that notion has been a central one in my life since I was a young adult. The idea that all things, even the bad things, even my sins and the disasters that have happened to me, all things are working for good with those that love God. Even the worst things are stepping stones to blessing. Anthony de Mello, uh, who is a Jesuit and an Indian, I'm sure many of you are quite familiar with him, said in his wonderful book, Satana, that if he were to choose the one form of prayer that made Christ's presence most real in his life, it would be the prayer of thanksgiving. I would concur. I, I, would, I would have found the same in my own life. He suggested that believers engage in the following prayer exercise, and I would uh, recommend this uh, to you. Think about anything, uh, either in the past or the present, that is causing you pain or distress or guilt or frustration. Now, that could be that your mother has cancer and it's not responding to treatment. It could be that your father is an alcoholic and drinks far too much. It could be that you've got a secret sin in your life. Maybe you've been unfaithful in your marriage. It could be that you're very frustrated that you're stuck in a job that you don't like and can't get another one. So think of anything in the past or the present 
that is causing you pain or, or distress or guilt or frustration. Now, if you're in any way to blame for this thing, express your regret and sorrow to the Lord. So obviously, if you've been unfaithful or committed some other serious sin, um, you may feel ashamed and you wish, oh, I wish that never happened, but it did happen. You have to say, well, Lord, I'm sorry that it happened. But now, says Anthony de Mello, of course, he's only echoing scripture when he says this, explicitly thank God for this, praise him for it. I'm a bit queasy about praising God for anything that's evil in our lives. I don't think you can praise God for something that was really evil. But you praise God in the evil circumstances, believing that they, God has his arms around them, his arms of mercy, and that he's going to bring good out of the evil. So thank God in those circumstances of evil. Next, tell him that you believe that even this fits into his plan for you. And so he will draw great good from this for you and others, even though you may not see the good. You mightn't see it now. You might never see it until the next life. But you, you thank God believing that um, where sin is abounding, where wrongdoing is abounding, God's grace will more abound in the future. And then he says, leave this thing and all the other events of your life, past, present, and to come, in the hands of God. And rest in the peace and relief that this will bring. When I read that, I was reminded of one of the Psalms, which says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Commit your life to him. Which to me means, hand everything over to him. And he will act, says the psalmist. That's the promise. So trust in the Lord with all your heart. God is faithful. God is good. God is benevolent. Hand over all the things that weigh you down to the Lord and believe God will act and he will act in a wonderful way. There was an English writer called William Law, and he said this, If anyone would tell you the shortest, surest way to all happiness and perfection, he must tell you to make it a rule to yourself to thank and praise God for everything that happens to you. For it is certain that whatever seeming calamity happens to you, if you thank and praise God for it, you will turn it into a blessing. Actually, it's just coming into my mind at this moment that I wrote a book on prayer oh, about 20 years ago. And I had a chapter in it on, th on Thanksgiving. And I put across this notion that we should thank God even for the bad things in our lives in the belief that God will draw good from the evil. And I got a wonderful letter from a nun who said that she had bought and read the book. She said she used to read it when she was in bed. And when she got to the bit about thanking God, not just for good things, but even in bad circumstances, believing that God will draw blessing from them, her feelings rebelled against the notion because she said, she was raped as a child by a policeman. And this had left a terrible scar on her psyche and had, had knock-on effects upon her psychosexual development and, and upon her relationships. And she said everything within her from an emotional point of view rebelled against what St. Paul said about thanking God always and for everything. But she said in obedience to God's word, she decided that she would try and thank God. And she did it first in a whisper. 
because she hadn't got much conviction about it. But the more she thanked God, the stronger her voice became. And finally, she was thanking God with great conviction. And she said it was like a miracle because a weight lifted from our shoulders, which had literally been there her whole life long. And healing began to pour into her life and into those psychosexual wounds which she had endured as a child. So just want to read what William Law says. For it is certain that whatever seeming calamity happens to you, if you thank and praise God for it, you will turn it into a blessing. That's what happened for that nun. And it's happened to many others too. Now, the psalmist says we enter into God's courts with praise. In other words, we get closer to God through praise. Having focused by means of thanksgiving on the gifts of God, one goes on to praise the, God, the good God who is the giver of the gifts. As Psalm 34 verse 1 says, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. Do you notice, brothers and sisters, it's very like the teaching about thanksgiving. I mean, it's obviously we would praise God when everything is going hunky-dory and going well. But I will praise the Lord at all times. That implies that we praise God even when things are going terribly wrong. That means that even when I'm at a funeral, maybe of my nearest and dearest, I will try and praise God. If not with my feelings, I will do it with my will and my voice. I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. Now, there are a number of ways of doing this by reading a, a praise psalm or singing hymns. You could sing them yourself or play them on your audio equipment. And of course, those of us who would have received the gift of tongues, we can praise God in tongues. I would do that more or less every day and have been doing that for the last, oh, 45 years. I'm sure that Merlin Carruthers, some of you may have read his books, from prison to praise and power and praise. I'm sure he was correct when he said that if one, if in adverse circumstances we praise God in an unconditional way, the circumstances themselves can change in a remarkable manner. This is because they've been opened up to the blessing of God who lives in the praises of his people. And that point is illustrated by a number of examples in both the Old and the New Testaments. For example, do you remember Jonah was swallowed by a whale um, because of his unfaithfulness? And we're told, though, when he was in the belly of the whale, which wouldn't be a very pleasant environment, um, what was he doing? He was praising God. If you were sailing past in a boat, you might have heard a little voice coming up through the waves and would have been the voice of Jonah praising God in the belly of the whale. And then we're told about the three young men who were thrown into the fiery furnace because they wouldn't sacrifice uh, to idols. And um, even though they're in the flames, they're praising God. See, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. And then there's the, the wonderful story about Paul and Silas. Do you remember uh, Paul delivered a woman from a spirit of the occult? And as a result, um, he was brought before the authorities. And um, he and Silas got a terrible uh, 
lashing with whips and then they were thrown into the deepest part of the prison and they were um, in chains or they were certainly kept there um, and instead of complaining which they had every right to do from a human point of view Paul and Silas practiced what Paul preached they praised God in all circumstances they thanked God in all circumstances. And what you see in the Bible is that when people praise God at all times and in all circumstances, blessing comes upon them and everything changes. So in the case of Jonah, he's coughed up onto the shore of liberty by the whale. In the case of the three young men in the fiery furnace, they're not burnt and eventually they're set free. And in the case of Paul and Silas, there must have been an earthquake because they're liberated from their cell. And they, and indeed all the other prisoners in the jail, were able to leave. And when the jailer then uh, realizes what's happened, he falls on the ground. Actually, he was going to commit suicide. Paul says, don't do it. We're all here. And that man comes to faith in Christ because Paul tells him about Jesus and his salvation. And later we're told his whole family accepts Christ and accepts baptism. So although Paul and Silas were in a dreadful situation, it became a stepping stone to blessing because they praised God in all circumstances. And God lives in the praises of his people. So praise has a powerful transforming effect. So it's good for a praying person to make a decision to praise the Lord, no matter what the situation may be. Now, of course, that doesn't mean we should suppress our negative feelings. So if I get news that I've got a very bad form of cancer and that I'm only expected to live for three months. The scriptures are telling me I should praise God. Now, we have to be honest. I, I don't feel like praising God at all. Quite the opposite. I feel angry with God. So, you know, prayer is not telling lies to God. You have to tell God the truth. So you'd have to say, Lord, to tell you the truth, at the feeling level, I feel angry with you. I feel let down. I think this isn't fair. I'm afraid. You know, please help me and all this sort of thing. But then in obedience to God's word, I will start praising God. Be it done unto me according to thy word, said Mary. Whatever he tells you, do it. Remember, they're the last words Mary speaks at Cana in Galilee. She said that to the servants. She says it to all of us. And scripture says, praise God in all circumstances. Praise him for everything. So even though I've got the deadly form of cancer, I'm going to praise God. What's in my mind? I believe that God's going to bring mysteriously good out of evil. I don't know how, but I believe he will. When I was a, a young priest, and you can see I'm an old one now, but uh, I was young once. <laughs> and I remember when I was in my late 20s or early 30s, I was a teacher. And I used to run a prayer group for boys. And I wrote a little hymn for the boys. And part of one of my hymns went as follows. I have decided to praise the Lord. No matter how I feel. God is always real. I have decided to praise the Lord. I'll praise him when I'm happy. I'll praise him when I'm sad. I'll praise him when I'm good. I'll praise him when I'm bad. I'll praise him when I'm up. I'll praise him when I'm down. I'll praise him when I'm weary. I'll praise him when I'm strong. I have decided to praise the Lord. Brothers and sisters, it's a decision. And if we're to go by the Bible, we should do it enthusiastically. 
And in the book of Sirach, chapter 43, verses 31 to 34, we read this. Lift up your voices to glorify the Lord, though he is still beyond your power to praise. Extol him with renewed strength and weary not, though you cannot reach the end. For who can see him or describe him? Or who can praise him as he is? The truth is, no matter how much we praise God, God is deserving of even more praise. We don't praise God for evil circumstances. We praise God in spite of those circumstances, in the belief that evil will not have the last word. It belongs to God and it will be a word of blessing and victory. Already tonight, um, we've heard the following verses being quoted from the book of Habakkuk. Joe quoted them. It's from chapter 3, verses 17 to 18. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. So what Habakkuk is saying is, even though there's disaster, utter disaster, and no food or drink, guess what? I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. He's confident God is going to bring good from bad. Blessing will abound sooner or later as we trust in the Lord. Remember what Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What will happen? All else will be added to you. And I would add in even to the point of miracles. Do you remember when Jesus was preaching to the 5,000 in the wilderness and then they found they had no food with which to feed the people. Jesus had been seeking first God's kingdom. He didn't lose his cool. He didn't get worried or anxious because he knew God, my father, will supply what is necessary. I've been seeking first the kingdom. God, my father, will add what is necessary. And, and he just blessed the few loaves they had and the few fish and they multiplied. The same principle applies in our lives. We have to live by faith and not by sight. And it's easy to say, you know, the divine mercy prayer, Jesus, I trust in you. It's much harder to really believe it when you're facing disaster. And you can see no way out and no answer. That's when we really have to trust. When praise is really strong, the kind of praise that we've been describing becomes what the Old Testament refers to as the Teruah Yahweh, which is the war cry of victory. In the time before the birth of Jesus, there were frequent references to battles in the Old Testament. Over and over again, the people of God had to contend with armies that were larger and better equipped than their own. But the Israelites had one great advantage. They had confidence that if they were following the Lord's will, God would be fighting with them. So no matter what odds were stacked against them, they would be victorious. So as they marched into battle, they would utter the terroir, the war cry. It was a piercing, blood-curdling war cry that was intended to strike terror into the hearts of their enemies. But it was also a liturgical chant that was meant to express their unshakable confidence in the one who would give them victory. There's a wonderful line in the second book of Chronicles. I think it's in, I've forgotten where it is exactly. I think it's chapter 19, where it says, the battle is not yours, but mine, says the Lord. And that's what the Jews believed. Even though the odds are stacked against us, 
we're going to win this battle because God is with us. And therefore, we're going to shout out our war cry, which was a war cry of praise. We're praising our God who will give us the victory. Now, late in the Old Testament, we find, well, not so late, after the time of David, we find that the chosen people had settled down in Palestine and there were much fewer wars. But they remembered the battle cry of victory. So they modified it for use in their temple worship. And it became known as the festal shout that is sometimes mentioned in the Psalms. For example, in Psalm 47 verses 1 to 8 we read, Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. God has ascended amid shouts of joy. The Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises for God is the King of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. However, Psalm 89 verse 15 sums up the biblical attitude when it declares, Blessed are the people who know the festal shout. So it's a kind of a war cry, but it's a liturgical war cry of victory. Our God reigns. The battle is not ours, it's God's. We could shout at the pandemic. We proclaim your greatness, Lord. Our battle with this pandemic is not ours, but yours, and you will have the victory. I was out in Palermo at the end of 2019 in Sicily, and we went to a hotel for a conference. And at one point, now they'd heard me talking about this festal shout in the past, but they said, we're going to have a time of praise. Uh, there were about a couple of hundred people there. It's a day I will never forget till my dying breath. They started just thunderous praise. They were shouting and jumping around and playing musical instruments. One guy had a, a shofar, the, the ram's horn that the Jews use, and he was blowing it. And they kept this up for half an hour. I was thinking, if there's any devils within a mile of this hotel, they will have to, to run away because the praise was so strong and there was such an anointing upon God's people. Brothers and sisters, we need that in more and more places around the world. Now, what are the effects of this praise? As we praise God, we experience many blessings, such as inner healing, an increase of joy, and an openness to the prophetic word of God. In these troubled times, praise pulls down the strongholds of the evil one. Paul says that in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. Cuban author Maria Vadia says in her book, Jesus, Man of War, his victory for those who praise him, quote, this is our privilege as sons and daughters, to execute judgment on our enemies as we praise our wonderful God. In other words, the victory of Calvary is enforced over our enemies through our praises. Remember that Jesus on the cross defeated the devil, but it's for us to enforce that victory over him. The high praises of God will clear the atmosphere of the enemies that come against us. Crime, witchcraft, violence, terrorism, sexual immorality, fear, anxiety, sickness, depression, addictions, sexual trafficking, and all kinds of abuse. If worship leaders would understand this, she says, our prayer groups would become powerhouses extending the kingdom of God on earth and displacing the enemy. We would be changed and transformed in this kind of atmosphere, impacting our families, cities and nation. If believers would believe this and do it, the Lord of hosts would show up 
and destroy the works of the devil in our midst. That's why we, I think, got the prophecy that we were to go up to high places, overlooking our, our cities, towns and localities, and to proclaim God's praises in the way that Maria Vadia, Vadia um, recommends. I want to conclude this talk with another quotation from William Law, the Englishman I quoted earlier. Would you know who is the greatest saint in the world? It's not he who prays most or fasts most. It's not he who gives alms or is most eminent for temperance, chastity or justice. But it is he who is always thankful to God, who wills everything that God wills, who receives everything as an instant, instance of God's goodness and has a heart always ready to praise God for it. Amen to that, brothers and sisters. If you want to be a saint and run fast along the road to holiness, may the praises of God be forever on your lips. Praise is the shortcut to holiness. So that's it, brothers and sisters. I hope I wasn't too long. But it's a great topic, isn't it? Yes, Father, it is. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. My dear brothers and sisters, Hallelujah. right now, uh, as I was listening,